49. Lilies That Fester Published in 20th Century, Volume 157, April 1955, this essay was reproduced in The World's Last Night, U.S. 1960, and they asked for a paper, Geoffrey Bless, 1962, and is now in Christian Reunion, 1990. In the Cambridge number of the 20th Century, 1955, Mr. John Allen asked why so many people go to such lengths to prove to us that really they are not intellectuals at all, and certainly not cultured. I believe I know the answer. Two parallels may help to ease it into the reader's mind. We all know those who shudder at the word refinement as a term of social approval. Sometimes they express their dislike of this usage by facetiously spelling it refinement with the implication that it is likely to be commonest in the mouths of those whose speech has a certain varnished vulgarity. And I suppose we can all understand the shudder whether we approve it or not. He who shudders feels that the quality of mind and behaviour which we call refined is nowhere less likely to occur than among those who aim at it and talk much about refinement. Those who have this quality are not obeying any idea of refinement when they abstain from swaggering, spitting, snatching, triumphing, calling names, boasting or contradicting. These modes of behaviour do not occur to them as possibles. If they did, that training and sensibility which constitute refinement would reject them as disagreeables, without reference to any ideal of conduct. Just as we reject a bad egg without reference to its possible effect on our stomachs. Refinement, in fact, is a name given to certain behaviour from without. From within, it does not appear as refinement. Indeed, it does not appear, does not become an object of consciousness at all. Where it is most named, it is most absent. I produce my next parallel with many different kinds of reluctance, but I think it too illuminating to be omitted. The word religion is extremely rare in the New Testament or the writings of mystics. The reason is simple. Those attitudes and practices to which we give the collective name of religion are themselves concerned with religion hardly at all. To be religious is to have one's attention fixed on God and on one's neighbour in relation to God. Therefore, almost by definition, a religious man, or a man when he is being religious, is not thinking about religion. He hasn't the time. Religion is what we, or he himself at a later moment, call his activity from outside. Of course, those who disdain the words refinement and religion may be doing so from bad motives. They may wish to impress us with the idea that they are well-bred or holy. Such people are regarding chatter about refinement or religion simply as symptomatic of vulgarity or worldliness, and eschew the symptom to clear themselves from the suspicion of the disease. But there are others who sincerely, and I believe rightly, think that such talk is not merely a symptom of, but a cause, active in producing that disease. The talk is inimical to the thing talked of, likely to spoil it where it exists, and to prevent its birth where it is unborn. Now, culture seems to belong to the same class of dangerous and embarrassing words. Whatever else it may mean, it certainly covers deep and genuine enjoyment of literature and the other arts. By using the word enjoyment, I do not mean to beg the vexed question about the role of pleasure in our experience of the arts. I mean frui, not delectare, as we speak of a man enjoying good health or an estate. And now, if I am certain of anything in the world, I am certain that while a man is, in this sense, enjoying Don Giovanni or the Oresteia, he is not caring one farthing about culture. Culture? The irrelevance of it. For just as to be fat or clever means to be fatter or cleverer than most, so to be called cultured must mean to be more so than most, and thus the very word carries the mind at once to comparisons and groupings and life in society. And what has all that to do with the horns that blow as the statue enters, or Clytemnestra crying, Now you have named me aright? In Howard's End, Mr. E. M. Forster excellently describes a girl listening to a symphony. She is not thinking about culture, nor about music, nor even about this music. She sees the whole world through the music. Culture, like religion, 
is a name given from outside to activities which are not themselves interested in culture at all, and would be ruined the moment they were. I do not mean that we are never to talk of things from the outside, but when the things are of high value and very easily destroyed, we must talk with great care, and perhaps the less we talk the better. To be constantly engaged with the idea of culture, and, above all, of culture as something enviable or meritorious, or something that confers prestige, seems to me to endanger those very enjoyments for whose sake we chiefly value it. If we encourage others or ourselves to hear, see, or read great art on the ground that it is a cultured thing to do, we call into play precisely those elements in us which must be in abeyance before we can enjoy art at all. We are calling up the desire for self-improvement, the desire for distinction, the desire to revolt from one group and to agree with another, and a dozen busy passions which, whether good or bad in themselves, are, in relation to the arts, simply a blinding and paralyzing distraction. At this point some may protest that by culture they do not mean the enjoyments themselves, but the whole habit of mind which such experiences, reacting upon one another and reflected on, build up as a permanent possession and some will wish to include the sensitive and enriching social life which, they think, will arise among groups of people who share this habit of mind. But this reinterpretation leaves me with the same difficulty. I can well imagine a lifetime of such enjoyments leading a man to such a habit of mind, but on one condition, namely, that he went to the arts for no such purpose. Those who read poetry to improve their minds will never improve their minds by reading poetry for the true enjoyments must be spontaneous and compulsive, and look to no remoter end. The muses will submit to no marriage of convenience. The desirable habit of mind, if it is to come at all, must come as a by-product, unsought. The idea of making it one's aim suggests that the shattering confidence which Goethe made to Eckermann, in all my youthful amours, the object I had in view was my own ennoblement. To this, I presume, most of us would reply that, even if we believe a love affair can ennoble a young man, we feel sure that a love affair undertaken for that purpose would fail of its object, because, of course, it wouldn't be a love affair at all. So much for the individual. But the claims made for the cultured group raise an embarrassing question. What, exactly, is the evidence that culture produces among those who share it a sensitive and enriching social life? If by sensitive we mean sensitive to real or imagined affronts, a case could be made out. Horace noted long ago that bards are a touchy lot. The lives and writings of the Renaissance humanists and the correspondence in the most esteemed literary periodicals of our own century will show that critics and scholars are the same. But sensitive in that meaning cannot be combined with enriching, Competitive and resentful egoisms can only impoverish social life. The sensitivity that enriches must be of the sort that guards a man from wounding others, not of the sort that makes him ready to feel wounded himself. Between this sensitivity and culture, my own experience does not suggest any causal connection. I have often found it among the uncultured. Among the cultured I have sometimes found it, and sometimes not. Let us be honest. I claim to be one of the cultured myself, and have no wish to foul my own nest. Even if that claim is disallowed, I have at least lived among them, and would not denigrate my friends. But we are speaking here among ourselves, behind closed doors. Frankness is best. The real traitor to our order is not the man who speaks within that order of its faults, but the man who flatters our corporate self-complacency. I gladly admit that we number among us men and women whose modesty, courtesy, fair-mindedness, patience in disputation, and readiness to see an antagonist's point of view are wholly admirable. I am fortunate to have known them. But we must also admit that we show as high a percentage as any group whatever of bullies, paranoiacs and poltroons, of backbiters, exhibitionists, mopes, milksops, and world-without-end bores. The loutishness that turns every argument into a quarrel is really no rarer among us than among the subliterate, the restless inferiority complex, stern to inflict but not 
stubborn to endure, which bleeds at a touch but scratches like a wildcat, is almost as common among us as among schoolgirls. If you doubt this, try an experiment. Take any one of those who vaunt most highly the adjusting, cleansing, liberating, and civilizing efforts of culture, and ask him about other poets, other critics, other scholars, not in the mass, but one by one, and name by name. Nine times out of ten he will deny of each what he claimed for all. He will certainly produce very few cases in which, on his own showing, culture has had its boasted results. Sometimes we suspect that he can think of only one. The conclusion most naturally to be drawn from his remarks is that the praise our order can most securely claim is that which Dr. Johnson gave to the Irish. They are an honest people. They never speak well of one another. It is then, at best, extremely doubtful whether culture produces any of those qualities which will enable people to associate with one another graciously, loyally, understandingly, and with permanent delight. When Ovid said that it softened our manners, he was flattering a barbarian king. But even if culture did all these things, we could not embrace it for their sake. This would be to use consciously and self-consciously, as means to extraneous ends, things which must lose all their power of conducing to those ends by the very fact of being so used. For many modern exponents of culture seem to me to be impudent in the etymological sense. They lack pudor. They have no shyness where men ought to be shy. They handle the most precious and fragile things with the roughness of an auctioneer and talk of our most intensely solitary and fugitive experiences as if they were selling us her hoover. It is all really very well summed up in Mr. Allen's phrase in the twentieth century, the faith in culture. A faith in culture is as bad as a faith in religion. Both expression imply a turning away from those very things which culture and religion are about. A culture, as a collective name for certain very valuable activities, is a permissible word. But culture hypostatized, set up on its own, made into a faith, a cause, a banner, a platform, is unendurable. For none of the activities in question cares a straw for that faith or cause. It is like a return to early Semitic religion, where names themselves were regarded as powers. Now a step further. Mr. Allen complained that, not content with creeping out of earshot when we can hear the voices of certain culture-mongers no longer, we then wantonly consort, or pretend that we consort, with the lowest of the lowbrows, and affect to share their pleasures. There are at this point a good many allusions which go over my head. I don't know what an AFN is. I am not fond of cellars, and modern whisky suits neither my purse, my palate, nor my digestion. But I think I know the sort of thing he has in mind, and I think I can account for it. As before, I will begin with a parallel. Suppose you had spent an evening among very young and very transparent snobs who were feigning a discriminating enjoyment of a great port, though any one who knew could see very well that, if they had ever drunk port in their lives before, it came from a grocer's. And then suppose that on your journey home you went into a grubby little tea-shop, and there heard an old body in a feather boa say to another old body with a smack of her lips, "'That was a nice cup of tea, dearie, that was. Did me good.' Would you not, at that moment, feel that this was like fresh mountain air? For here, at last, would be something real. Here would be a mind really concerned about that in which it expressed concern. Here would be pleasure. Here would be undebauched experience, spontaneous and compulsive, from the fountainhead. A live dog is better than a dead lion. In the same way, after a certain kind of sherry party, where there have been cataracts of culture, but never one word or one glance that suggested a real enjoyment of any art, any person, or any natural object. My heart warms to the schoolboy on the bus who is reading fantasy and science fiction, rapt and oblivious of all the world beside. For here also I should feel that I had met something real and live and unfabricated, genuine literary experience, spontaneous and compulsive, disinterested. I should have hopes of that boy. Those who have greatly cared for any book whatever may possibly come to care some day for good books. The organs of appreciation exist in them. They are not impotent. 
and even if this particular boy is never going to like anything severer than science fiction, even so. The child whose love is here at least doth reap one precious gain, that he forgets himself. I should still prefer the live dog to the dead lion, perhaps even the wild dog to the overtame poodle or peak. I should not have spent so many words on answering Mr. Allen's question, neither of us matters sufficiently to justify it, unless I thought that the discussion led to something of more consequence. This I will now try to develop. Mr. Foster feels anxious because he dreads theocracy. And now, if he expects to see a theocracy set up in modern England, I myself believe his expectation to be wholly chimerical. But I wish to make it very clear that, if I thought the thing in the least probable, I should feel about it exactly as he does. I fully embrace the maxim which he borrows from a Christian that all power corrupts. I would go further. The loftier the pretensions of the power, the more meddlesome, inhuman, and oppressive it will be. A theocracy is the worst of all possible governments. All political power is at best a necessary evil, but it is least evil when its sanctions are most modest and commonplace when it claims no more than to be useful or convenient, and sets itself strictly limited objectives. Anything transcendental or spiritual, or even anything very strongly ethical in its pretensions is dangerous, and encourages it to meddle with our private lives. Let the shoemaker stick to his last. Thus the Renaissance doctrine of divine right is for me a corruption of monarchy, Rousseau's general will of democracy racial mysticisms of nationality. And theocracy, I admit, and even insist, is the worst corruption of all. But then I don't think we are in any danger of it. What I think we are really in danger of is something that would be only one degree less intolerable, and intolerable in almost the same way. I would call it charyantocracy, not the rule of the saints, but the rule of the witty, the charming, the hôtel de Rambouillet, the wits, the polite, the souls, the apostles, the sensitive, the cultured, the integrated, or whatever the latest password may be. I will explain how I think it could come about. The old social classes have broken up. Two results follow. On the one hand, since most men, as Aristotle observed, do not like to be merely equal with all other men, we find all sorts of people building themselves into groups within which they can feel superior to the mass. Little unofficial self-appointed aristocracies. The cultured increasingly form such a group. Notice their tendency to use the social term vulgar of those who disagree with them. Notice that Mr. Allen spoke of rebels against or deserters from this group as denying not that they are intellectual, but that they are intellectuals not hiding a quality, but deprecating inclusion in a class. On the other hand, inevitably there is coming into existence a new real ruling class, what has been called the managerial class. The coalescence of these two groups, the unofficial, self-appointed aristocracy of the cultured, and the actual managerial rulers will bring us to charyantocracy. But the two groups are already coalescing because eduction is increasingly the means of access to the managerial class. And, of course, eduction, in some sense, is a very proper means of access. We do not want our rulers to be dunces. But education is coming to have a new significance. It aspires to do, and can do, far more to the pupil than education, except perhaps that of the Jesuits, has ever done before. For one thing, the pupil is now far more defenceless in the hands of his teachers. He comes increasingly from businessmen's flats or workmen's cottages, in which there are few books or none. He has hardly ever been alone. The educational machine seizes him very early and organises his whole life to the exclusion of all unsuperintended solitude or leisure. The hours unsponsored, uninspected, perhaps even forbidden, reading, the ramblings, and the long, long thoughts in which those of luckier generations first discovered literature and nature and themselves are a thing of the past. If a Traherne or a Wordsworth were born today, he would be cured before he was twelve. In short, the modern pupil is the ideal patient for those masters who, not content with teaching a subject, would create a character. 
helpless plasticine. Or if by chance, for nature will be nature, he should have any powers of resistance, they know how to deal with him. I am coming to that point in a moment. Secondly, the nature of the teaching has changed. In a sense, it had changed for the better. That is, it demands far more of the master and, in recompense, makes his work more interesting. It has become far more intimate and penetrating, more inward. Not content with making sure that the pupil has read and remembered the text, it aspires to teach him appreciation. It seems harsh to quarrel with what at first sounds so reasonable an aim. Yet there is a danger in it. Everyone now laughs at the old test paper with its context questions and the like, and people ask, what good can that sort of thing do a boy? But surely to demand that the test paper should do the boy good is like demanding that a thermometer should heat a room. It was the reading of the text which was supposed to do the boy good. You set the paper to find out if he had read it. And just because the paper did not force the boy to produce or to feign appreciation, it left him free to develop in private, spontaneously, as an out-of-school activity which would never earn any marks, such appreciation as he could. That was a private affair between himself and Virgil, or himself and Shakespeare. Nine times out of ten, probably nothing happened at all. But wherever appreciation did occur, and quite certainly it sometimes did, it was genuine, suited to the boy's age and character. No exotic, but the healthy growth of its native soil and weather. But when we substitute exercises in practical criticism for the old dry papers, a new situation arises. The boy will not get good marks, which means in the long run that he will not get into the managerial class, unless he produces the kind of responses and the kind of analytic method which commend themselves to his teacher. This means, at best, that he is trained to the precocious anticipation of responses, and of a method inappropriate to his years. At worst, it means that he is trained in the, not very difficult, art of simulating the orthodox responses. For nearly all boys are good mimics. Depend upon it. Before you have been teaching for a term, everyone in the form knows pretty well the sort of stuff that goes down with prickly Popeye. In the old days also they knew what went down, but the only thing that went down was correct answers to factual questions, and there were only two ways of producing those, working or cheating. The thing would not be so bad if the responses which the pupils had to make were even those of the individual master. But we have already passed that stage. Somewhere, I have not yet tracked it down, there must be a kind of culture monger's central bureau, which keeps a sharp lookout for deviationists. At least, there is certainly someone who sends little leaflets to schoolmasters, printing half a dozen poems on each, and telling the master not only which the pupils must be made to prefer, but exactly on what grounds. The impertinence of it. We know what Mulcaster or Boyer would have done with those leaflets. Thus to say that, under the nascent regime, education alone will get you into the ruling class, may not mean simply that the failure to acquire certain knowledge and to reach a certain level of intellectual competence will exclude you. That would be reasonable enough. But it may come to mean, perhaps means already, something more. It means that you cannot get in without becoming, or without making your masters believe that you have become, a very specific kind of person, one who makes the right responses to the right authors. In fact, you can get in only by becoming, in the modern sense of the word, cultured. This situation must be distinguished from one that has often occurred before. Nearly all ruling classes, sooner or later, in some degree or other, have taken up culture and patronized the arts. But when that happens, the culture is the result of their position, one of the luxuries or privileges of their order. The situation we are now facing will be almost the opposite. Entry into the ruling class will be the reward of culture. Thus we reach chariotocracy. And not only is the thing likely to happen, it is already planned and avowed. Mr. J. W. Saunders has set it all out in an excellent article entitled Poetry in the Managerial Age. Essays in Criticism, July 1954. He there faces the fact that modern poets are read almost exclusively by one another. He looks about for a remedy. And naturally, he does not suggest that the poets should do anything about it. 
for it is taken as basic by all the culture of our age that whenever artists and audience lose touch, the fault must be wholly on the side of the audience. I have never come across the great work in which this important doctrine is proved. The remedy which occurs to Mr. Saunders is that we should provide our poets with a conscript audience, a privilege last enjoyed, I believe, by Nero. And he tells us how this can be done. We get our coordinators through eduction. Success in examinations is the road into the ruling class. All that we need do, therefore, is to make not just poetry, but the intellectual discipline which the critical reading of poetry can foster, the backbone of our educational system. In other words, practical criticism, or something of the sort, exercised, no doubt, chiefly on modern poets, is to be the indispensable subject failure in which excludes you from the managerial class. And so our poets get their conscript readers. Every boy or girl who is born is presented with the choice. Read the poets whom we, the cultured, approve, and say the sort of things we say about them, or be a prole. And this, picking up on a previous point, shows how chariotocracy can deal with the minority of pupils who have tastes of their own, and are not pure plasticine. They get low marks. You kick them off the educational ladder at a low rung, and they disappear into the proletariat. Another advantage is that, besides providing poets with a conscript audience for the moment, you can make sure that the regnant literary dynasty will reign almost forever. For the deviationists whom you have kicked off the ladder will, of course, include all those troublesome types who, in earlier ages, were apt to start new schools and movements. If there had been a sound chariotocracy in their day, the young Chaucer, the young Dunn, the young Wordsworth and Coleridge could have been dealt with. And thus literary history, as we have known it in the past, may come to an end. Literary man, so long a wild animal, will have become a tame one. Having explained why I think a chariotocracy probable, I must conclude by explaining why I think it undesirable. Culture is a bad qualification for a ruling class because it does not qualify men to rule. The things we really need in our rulers, mercy, financial integrity, practical intelligence, hard work and the like, are no more likely to be found in cultured persons than in anyone else. A culture is a bad qualification in the same way as sanctity. Both are hard to diagnose and easy to feign. Of course, not every chariotocrat will be a cultural hypocrite, nor every theocrat a tartuffe. But both systems encourage hypocrisy, and make the disinterested pursuit of the quality they profess to value more difficult. But hypocrisy is not the only evil they encourage. There are, as in piety, so in culture, states which, if less culpable, are no less disastrous. In the one we have the goody-goody, the docile youth who has neither revolted against nor risen above the routine pietisms and respectabilities of his home. His conformity has won the approval of his parents, his influential neighbours, and his own conscience. He does not know that he has missed anything and is content. In the other, we have the adaptable youth to whom poetry has always been something set for evaluation. Success in this exercise has given him pleasure and let him into the ruling class. He does not know what he has missed, does not know that poetry ever had any other purpose, and is content. Both types are much to be pitied, but both can sometimes be very nasty. Both may exhibit spiritual pride, but each in its proper form, since the one has succeeded by acquiescence and repression, but the other by repeated victory in competitive performances. To the pride of the one, sly, simpering, and demure, we might apply Mr. Allen's word, smug, especially if we let in a little of its older sense. My epithet for the other word, I think, be swaggering. It tends, in my experience, to be raw, truculent, eager to give pain, insatiable in its demands for submission, resentful and suspicious of disagreement. Where the goody-goody slinks and sidles and purrs, and sometimes scratches like a cat, his opposite number in the ranks of the cultured gobbles like an enraged turkey. And perhaps both types are less curable than the hypocrite proper. A hypocrite might conceivably repent and mend, or he might be unmasked and rendered innocuous. But who could bring to repentance, and who can unmask, those who were attempting no deception? 
who don't know that they are not the real thing because they don't know that there ever was a real thing. Lastly, I reach the point where my objections to theocracy and to chariotocracy are almost identical. Lilies that fester smell far worse than weeds. The higher the pretensions of our rulers are, the more meddlesome and impertinent their rule is likely to be, and the more the thing in whose name they rule will be defiled. The highest things have the most precarious foothold in our nature. By making sanctity or culture a moyen de parvenir, you help to drive them out of the world. Let our masters leave these two at least alone. Leave us some region where the spontaneous, the unmarketable, the utterly private can still exist. As far as I am concerned, Mr. Allen fell short of the mark when he spoke of a retreat from the faith in culture. I don't want retreat. I want attack, or, if you prefer the word, rebellion. I write in the hope of rousing others to rebel. So far as I can see, the question has nothing to do with the difference between Christians and those who, unfortunately, since the word has long borne a useful and wholly different meaning, have been called humanists. I hope that red herring will not be brought in. I would gladly believe that many atheists and agnostics care for the things I care for. It is for them I have written. To them I say, the faith in culture is going to strangle all those things unless we can strangle it first. And there is no time to spare.'